Okay. Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. <clears throat> welcome uh, everyone to uh, Mason Hall and to the sixth presentation of the Polly Walker Ecology Fund lecture. Uh, my name is Bob Lawrence. Uh, I'm a has-been. I'm the uh, founding director of the Center for Livable Future, and uh, Martin Bloom, our director, sitting up front, just uh, came in from the airport and asked me if I would carry on, so I'm delighted to do that, but uh, Martin, it's really good to have you at the helm. Uh, this uh, is the first time we've been on the Homewood campus, although when the CLF was founded back in 1996, several giants of the Homewood faculty were critical advisors as we developed the new center. The late Reds Bowman, uh, who had twice served as uh, provost and was chair of Dogi for a number of years. Um, we had uh, chairs uh, from Earth and Planetary Sciences. We had people from uh, other departments who were advising us and critically important in the development of what really is a university-wide center. Uh, a few words about Polly Walker, for whom this Ecology Fund lectureship is named. Uh, Polly was the first real hire uh, for the center, and she served as our associate director for almost f 15 years. Um, Polly uh, was a uh, instrumental, really, in drawing upon her wide knowledge of the environmental community in the greater Baltimore area, where she had been an activist for many years. And uh, she now lives in Providence, Rhode Island, and I think may be watching this on uh, streaming live uh, feed. If so, hello, Polly, and uh, we're sorry you're not able to be with us physically. Um, the Center for a Livable Future has a broad vision of the importance of the food system in all of its aspects uh, to public health. And we have uh, experts in food system work from food production to the things that motivate people in their choices of diet uh, to uh, problems associated with access in the community to healthy and safe food. Uh, I'm really pleased that uh, Martin Bloom, uh, whom we recruited from the World Food Program in Rome, brings an international perspective. We have done some work internationally, but we expect much more to come. With uh, regard to some of the things that we hope uh, interact with uh, Homewood, uh, the students who are here from the undergraduate campus now. Uh, we often have research assistants who are part-time with us during the academic year uh, come down from Homewood campus who are interested in both public health, nutrition, and food system work. We encourage you to think about that for next year if you haven't already been involved. So uh, to introduce our speaker today, I'm going to now turn to Leo Horrigan, who, uh, if Polly was our first hire, Leo was probably about our third hire. Uh, and Leo has had a long-standing interest uh, in all things related to the food system, a former journalist, and now heading up our food system uh, project. He and Mike Milley just returned from uh, coastal Maine, where Cynthia and I now live. He was uh, filming for a new, the latest in the CLF films. But Leo, why don't you come up and introduce our distinguished speaker. Thank you, Bob. Um, and thank you, everybody, for showing up here. The weather out there is um, a very big draw, so it was nice of you to come inside for a while. Um, those of you who didn't have to. Uh, so first, I'll do a little housekeeping. Um, I don't think you mentioned cell, phone, cell phones off or muted, whatever you need to do with them. Um, also, just to let you know, uh, well, Bob did mention that we're live streaming and recording, um, and there will be a Q&A afterwards, and there will be microphones going around, so we just ask you to wait for that microphone to come to you. Um, and so then there's also a, um, a chance to submit questions via Twitter, and Darcy from our communications team is going to let me know if we're doing everything right with that. And she's going to feed some questions from Twitter eventually, right? Is that? If we get any. If we get any, exactly. It'll be a mystery. Okay. 
Um, and uh, just a reminder that you can sign up for, if you're interested in future CLF events, you can sign up to, to get notifications about that at our website. Um, and I also uh, wanted to acknowledge, before I introduce Catherine, I want to acknowledge that her brother Jonathan, who's sometimes her partner in crime on some of her environmental education work, is with us today too. So we're pleased to have Jonathan here also. Um, I was asked to introduce Catherine because um, when I was first hired, um, to CLF, it was actually in a previous century, um, and I was I was hired as an urban agriculture coordinator, and that sounded like a really cool uh, title. But once I got past that, I was wondering what does it actually mean? Like, how will I manifest this in the world? This this title of urban agriculture coordinator. So I was kind of casting about for some kind of inspiration, and during that process, I came across the story of what Catherine Sneed had been doing in San Francisco with uh, inmates, and I won't steal any of her thunder and tell her story, but I, I will say that I was captivated by this idea of the redemptive power of the people-plant connection. It was really, um, it really intrigued me, and I wanted to know more. At, at that time, um, Bob mentioned that Polly Walker and I were kind of like an army of two as far as the staff of CLF, and we were um, trying to make connections in the community, and we did a lot of work with something called the Rose Street Community Center, which is in East Baltimore. And they had a lot of contact with uh, people who were coming out of prison, ex-offenders who were trying to reintegrate. And so they somehow got us, I don't even remember the details of it, but we somehow ended up at a meeting at this Metropolitan Transition Center, which is a minimum security prison downtown in Baltimore. And uh, we, ended up, we got a tour of the prison, which was very eye-opening. It was the first time I think I'd been inside a prison, as far as you know. Um, <laughs> And, um, and then uh, after the tour, we actually sat down with the uh, warden and some other of the officials there, and uh, we're talking about possibilities for um, collaboration with the Rose Street Community Center and reintegration projects for inmates. But I had sort of been, um, having read Catherine's story, I, I think a little bit, little bit of her spirit had entered me and emboldened me to ask the warden about the, um, court, the large courtyard they had in the middle of the prison, which looked to me like a place, I think at that time, since I was an urban, urban agriculture coordinator, everything looked like a potential garden to me. You know, it was like, I see an empty lot, it's like, what could we grow there? So, so I asked him if he, what he thought of the idea of putting uh, a garden there and having inmates tend, tend plants there and, and vegetables. And somewhat to my surprise, he actually latched onto the idea right away. Uh, so then we started trying to fundraise for a garden there, and um, I had a partner in crime with that from uh, Parks and People Foundation here in Baltimore. And I left CLF in 2002, but that project continued, that fundraising continued, and the, the garden did actually finally um, come to fruition. Um, I, you know, I've been disconnected from that, but I know I've periodically met people who updated me on it. So, so basically, I, it um, strikes me that here was a project that happened in part because of inspiration from someone that I'd never met until today, actually. Catherine and I had never met. So it, it, it strikes me, this is like the strange power of inspiration, that sometimes the person who inspires you doesn't even know, it's an unseen process, this inspiration that, that happens. And so, and I also know that I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm only one of hundreds or thousands of people who have been inspired by your work, Catherine, and that's why I was very pleased when you said you would be willing to come and, and give this lecture today. And I'm sorry Polly wasn't here because I know she would really um, love to be here and meet you uh, in person. So, so thank you so much for joining us today, and I know you'll be an inspiration. Your stories will be an inspiration to, to all of us. So, um, please help me welcome Catherine Sneed. Yes. Good afternoon. I'm honored to be here put it mildly. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I wanted to start with Anthony, um, and I'm going to ask beautiful Alicia if she could play a video about Anthony, and then I would like to start from there, if I may. And I have to see Anthony myself. Thank you. How is it going to be I sold lots of dough. That was something out there that I had. I thought as a youngster, it was the best thing ever. I went into San Bruno County Jail. I met Captain Sneed there, and at that time she had a 
horticulture program that was given through the jail system. And so she came and got me and put me into that program. I didn't know I was going to stay for stay. But then as time went on, I started realizing that this is the right way to go. I got to stay focused. I got to stay right. Because we're not going to have another option. I, I know that I just wanted to be a little person, you know, and I learned that the working wasn't really bad, you know, and I always really worked when I was a kid, I had to take her out and all that type of stuff. And here I am now, you know, with a life, with a home that I can call my home, in San Francisco, something that a young black man always dreamed of. I got a good job, I can do it to, you know, help my family grow. I work with the PDC. I sit on the 251 Union Board, negotiating a contract with the PDC. I mean, it's a blessing, you know. I got my mother, it's fun. You know, I'm no longer considered, quote unquote, a criminal. And I owe it all to the Garden Project. I'm doing something better with my life now. So being in this position, doing this type of work, it, it, it all pay off in the long run. It all pay off in the long run. Thank you. I, that probably wasn't a good idea for me to start with Anthony because I'm crying. <laughs> And I have to say that when I first met Anthony, he was 18. It was 1987. And Anthony read at kindergarten level. And so I remember when I learned that he, like so many of the people that were in our jail, read at kindergarten level. I remember thinking to myself, how on earth does he have a chance? He has no chance. What can be done to help this young man? And then I kicked him out. He was with me for two days. And he was such, a, he was such an idiot. I'm sorry. But he was. He, he talked really bad, did everything bad. And he was like, this is, you know, it was a joke. And I'm like, it's not a joke. And, you know, I'm out. And I saw him five years later. And he came to um, the garden that I had started outside of the jail. Because every day at the jail, when folks got out for about a year, they would meet me in this vacant lot. Where's Leo? A vacant lot that uh, someone who I had approached to give us a uh, excuse me, to give us a grant um, had said, well, there's a nice lot there. And I was like, well, we want money. We don't want some lot. We need money to do this program. And he said, well, this is this lot. Turned out it wasn't his lot. It actually belonged uh, to Southern Pacific Railroad. and. Uh, for about a year, all the prisoners, when they would get out, would meet me at this lot. And we would get clothes and food and, and whatever we can, money, and give it to them. And we were cleaning out this lot. It, has, it was full of garbage. Um, and as I said, it was belonged to Southern Pacific Railroad. And what I found was that Southern Pacific Railroad owned many lots in this neighborhood in Hunters Point, San Francisco's one of San Francisco's Superfund sites, actually, an ex-Superfund site. And what I, when I started cleaning it up with them, I spoke to Southern Pacific and I said, you know, we're going to clean it up and, and uh, I'd like to make a garden here. And they were like, you got $500,000? I'm like, no, no, you don't understand. We're, we're going to clean it up and we're going to, you know, this is going to help the neighborhood and, and you'll, you could be our partner. And they're like, where's the $500,000? And so, it was probably inspired by the prisoners, maybe, but maybe not. Um, we started, we actually climbed over the fence, threw the garbage over the fence and cleaned it up, and it took a couple of months, but we, every, every day we climbed over this fence and took the garbage out, um, and finally began growing things. Um, the New York Times did an article about us, and then I called Southern Pacific back, and I was like, you know, We'd really like to do this. And they were saying, okay, you want a lease? And we got a lease. 
Um, and Anthony had just gotten out of prison. He had been in prison for five years. And when he came, I was like, oh, no. And he said, oh, no, I'm different. I'm different. I have a kid now. I want to do something different with my life. And I was like, and he said, no, no, really, I promise. I said, well, if you promise, be here tomorrow at 9.30. No, be here tomorrow at very early. Anthony was there very early. And Anthony came every day. Anthony went on then to plant with us 10,000 street trees. We began a program because we got a contract with the city to plant trees. Anthony stayed with us, became supervisor, helped us to plant 10,000 trees. Anthony today, as you saw, works for the San Francisco Water Department. He is the labor supervisor now, negotiating millions of dollars in contracts for the laborers in San Francisco. And this is his story. But what I know is this story is the story of the people that I've worked with over the 40 years now that I'm going into working with them. And it's the story of, I think, why folks are in jail. Why, and which to me is the same reason that we're talking here about food and access to food. What I learned in the 40 years that I've been working for the Sheriff's Department is that many of the people that come to our jail, if you ask them, what were you eating before you got to jail? It was very similar to what I was feeding my children before I got the kidney disease that was supposed to kill me. Potato chips, anything I could afford a few hot dogs, some Kool-Aid, we were good. They were eating, they had food. I was a college, I was getting college work study and I was doing the best I could. But my, uh, I was in law school. My prison law professor started a program to help prisoners with legal issues that they might have in the jail while they were in the jail. And so I went to work with him and then he decided, he was 30 years old, he decided to run for sheriff, ran and won, which was a huge thing, and then offered me a job, which was a huge thing. <laughs> um, it meant a paycheck. It meant, it meant that I could buy real food. It meant that my kids had medical coverage. But it also meant that for the first time, I felt like I had a future. I felt like I was making a real contribution. And when I started working in the jail, I started with just doing the legal services. I did that for two years. After two years, I developed a kidney disease that they at first weren't sure what, what, which one it was, whether it was the one that would kill you or the one that you might live with. And then they, after a year of being back and forth in the hospital, they said, you know, there's nothing else we could do for you. You should go home and decide what you're going to do because there's nothing else to be done. And I was like, no, I'm 20-something years old, I'm not ready to die. And they were like, uh, <laughs> and uh, Michael's chief of staff, who was a friend, who was an educator, he had a PhD in education, he was always giving us books to read. He was always giving us books. And, I, and so he comes to the hospital with this book, and he's like, read this book. I'm like, they just told me I'm going to die, and you want me to read this book? He's like, this is the grapes of wrath. Read the book. Okay, read the book. He was from New York. I was like, okay, I'll, I'll read the book. So I read the book, and I believe that the message of the book was that when people connect with land, they have hope. And I was like, hmm, this is exactly what we need around this camp, this hope. And so Michael Hennessy, our sheriff, came to say goodbye to me. And I was like, Michael, I want to I, I wanna get out of the hospital, and I want to come back to work. And he was like, okay, sure. By all means. And he's like, yeah, you're going to be dead in a couple of months. It's okay. Yeah. And I said, and I want to bring the prisoners out. He's like, no problem, Kath. You do that, okay? And so I started bringing the prisoners out. Um, and I couldn't, well, when I, when I showed up, I was really surprised at their response. Because as I said, I had worked in the jail for two years. And I have to say, the prisoners were not the best people. They smoked a lot, fought a lot, was a lot of noise. It was horrendous it mildly. Um, and then their, their life stories and what, they were, what their values were, everything was pretty hard, I would say. And so I was really surprised at how, see, how them seeing me 
not able to walk, completely looking different, how that affected them. Because I, I never felt that they were bothered by the fact that their families didn't particularly care for them. They, they didn't seem to care much about their children. And really, they didn't seem to care about much of anything. But here they were, seemingly caring about me. And so we started going out every day. And every day, I would come, and they would all be ready to go. I mean, they would have their thin uh, jail clothes on, their fl flip-flops, and they'd be ready to go. And they would carry me out to the farm, which, which was about at least four blocks in distance from the jail itself, and put me on a log. And I would say, OK, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, because I wasn't a gardener then. Um, but our father certainly made us be workers and cleaners. And so I was like, hey, we're going to clean this mess up. It, the jail had been a farm, or where we were was part of the jail farm. They hadn't farmed in 30 years, so it was all overgrown. We had no tools. The prisoners, as I said, had flip-flops. There was no heat, no light. Um, I had no food for them. But within six months, the deputies in the jail were helping me to get food to the prisoners. Um, the prisoners were very, very, I mean, I was amazed. They would work and work and work and work and then go back to the jail and be so tired and then go to sleep. And the deputies were like, what's going on out there? And after a while, when we started actually producing broccoli and stuff, they were like, ah. And then within two years, I was in remission. Within three years, the entire jail came out every day for a few hours at a time. But then what began to happen is I began to, to have more and more people asking me, could they stay at the jail? Did they have to get out? They didn't want to get out. They wanted to stay there. They felt so good. They were doing, we were doing so many wonderful things, growing stuff. It was so nice. What is that sound? Those are birds. That's the sky. Those are flowers. Um, and, but of course, they couldn't stay in the jail. And so that was our, our, my incentive to begin the next phase of our program, the Garden Project. And that was in 1996. Um, and what always struck me, even then, was the fact that the people that were in our jail, in, in our jails and prisons throughout our country, because in the 40 years I've been doing a lot of talking with people, it seems that most of those folks have not been able to work for whatever reason. And what I found is they haven't been able to work because, unlike me, their father didn't get up and go to work every day. Their mother didn't get up and go to work every day. They had no experience working for, again, for whatever reason. But the biggest reason that I have heard and learned was it was because they were black, they were brown, they were uneducated. And it just seemed to me that this was something that could be learned. You could, learn, you could teach people how to work. You could teach people how, the importance of work. You could motivate people to overcome whatever it is that was challenging them. And you know, people, I, I, people called me many names. Pollyanna was one of them. Um, and I just felt like, well, yeah, it may sound very cornball and Pollyanna or whatever you want to call it, but what I know is this. I know that if people have a purpose, then they have hope. And I've spent my this last, actually it's 39 years, um, trying to cultivate that hope. And this part of the program, the beginning part, where over a thousand prisoners probably were in, our, in the horticulture program, this was in many, many years ago. And I am now working with the grandchildren of the, children, the young people that I worked with. Um, and in this video, the two children that are pictured are Anthony's children. Um, the boy is 11. Last summer, he was my special assistant. And the difference between him and his son was so huge because Nasir has a love of frogs. He knew what frogs were. He knew where to find the frogs. He knew that leaves would decompose. He knew that you don't kill worms. And 
what I realized and what, I, what I'm realizing is that well, you really can grow hope. You really can grow just as we are growing plants. We really can help people to grow. And the hardest part has been being able to sustain what we're doing, being able to, to know that what we're doing is making that difference and not just to have it be, well, it's a, it feels good and it seems like it would make a difference. But what I know is I know that keeping Anthony out of prison for the rest of his life has saved San Francisco millions of dollars because it takes millions of dollars to keep people in a cage, millions per person. But when you look at the police department, the probation department, the judges, the families, I mean the community, it's millions of dollars. But it also takes millions of dollars to keep people well after they're sick. And so when we started growing vegetables and the, the prisoners and folks were like, oh, so we're going to make money for the program selling this and selling that. I was like, no, we're not going to sell it. They're like, what do you mean you're not going to sell it? What's wrong with you? It's like, we're going to give it away. <laughs> and we started giving it away. And I felt and still feel that that's the right thing to do because giving is a way of continuing, is a way of connecting, is a way of uplifting, and but also giving is a way for people who feel that they are nobody to feel that they can make a contribution. And what I know is I know that the people, the thousands of people that we've employed during my career doing this work, I know because I see them, I know their families, I generations of their families. I know their neighborhoods. And I know that for the first time, like Anthony feels pride, these people feel pride because they're making a contribution. You mentioned Wendell Berry. I had the good fortune of meeting Wendell Berry. Actually, I spent the night with my daughter at his house with Tanya. Um, and him and I had talked at something in Washington many years ago. And he didn't know I was in the audience. And he started talking about me, and I'm sitting there, and I started crying. And, and they're like, she's right here. And then he made me come up, and we became friends. <laughs> but but uh, and he, he did a, a wonderful fundraiser for us also. And, and he, I asked him to do another fundraiser. And he said, no, I'm too old. I'm not doing anything anymore. Um, but I know that that's not the truth. <laughs> but I want to tell you some about our program today. Today, actually, when I get home tomorrow, we have 376 applications from children as young as 11 and as old as, I think the oldest it might be 22. We've, in the last 10 years, have been employing large numbers of children um, in the summer to help us we, we have a contract with our utilities company. It's $2 million. It pays for the program. It pays the students. They are in San Francisco. Our minimum wage is $15. Um, it pays the staff that now have medical benefits as well as a salary. But it also has allowed us to work and get paid for our work, which is a lot better than trying to make payroll with a grant. It's also a lot better to be able to say, you guys, we did this. The work that we're doing is a contribution to San Francisco. When we are in different neighborhoods and people come up, at first, sometimes they're afraid that maybe the prisoners have escaped. Um, and once I assure them they're actually, that they're not prisoners, um, and, and when they see that they are here and that they see that they're reservoirs that are in some cases the only gardens in or the only green spaces in their neighborhoods when they see them tended by people who were homeless maybe who are by by young people by, by kids who they would think would do bad things but here they are working and doing stuff and chopping and dragging and working very hard um, they change their mind they see and, and I, I think that it has a bigger purpose and the purpose is for, to let people see 
that people can make a contribution, that people want to make a contribution, that we need to be able to make a contribution in order to stand up, in order to continue. And it seems that with these young people, with the children that we're working with, that they're just so enthusiastic about the opportunity to work, at the, to the opportunity to be outside, because this is also their opportunity to be children. Because yes, they're working, yes, they're getting paid, but they're also skipping and singing and happy and this is so great and they're paying us to do this stuff. And, but also they know the seniors and the families that are standing in soup kitchen lines to wait for our food for hours. Some of them, their families have done that, are in several schools, they have pantries and in the pantries they're giving away the vegetables that we grew and the children and everyone says, Catherine, they're young adults. They are young adults, but they're also children to me. Um, the, the young adults start the, the vegetables in the summer, plant, and then San Francisco, or it's the Bay Area, and so we are feeding people until, usually till April. By April, we have at least Swiss chard still left. But last year, we grew over 100 tons of vegetables. Um, we landscape 1,400 acres of reservoir, including working at Yo uh, the reservoir in Yosemite, Hetch Hetchy. Um, it's been a lot of work. And what I see and what I know is that these young people, and the ex-offenders, some of whom are our, our staff, for the first time know that they are somebody, that they can do something. And but more importantly to me for the, the, ch the younger ones, they are meeting and seeing people who are doing stuff, like the young people that I had lunch with. The opportunity for them to meet people that have been to school or going to school, people that have jobs, people that are in various sectors working, is something that they're hungry as heck for. And they are so excited by. And you know, I, I had never worked with teenagers really. And so I was really surprised that they, first of all, I could say, do this, and they do it. Uh, uh, we work with uh, the police department also. The, the police during the summer um, actually have the cadets and a few officers work with us. Um, last summer we had 30 cadets and 10 officers. The wonderful thing is that this to me is also a way, because right now law enforcement needs to do, learn how to do something different. And I think it has to start young. It has to start with young people learning that the law is a very different thing than it, we thought it was. And, and crime is very, has very specific reasons. It's not just bad people doing bad things. Yes, they've done bad things. But for the most part, the bad is, is that they did it to survive. And they're doing it to survive. And I was telling the police chief the other day, you know, there, uh, in San Francisco, there's a huge problem with people breaking into cars and stealing everything. It's like, yeah, those are the same people that we had when they were 14. They now are not in our program. They don't have a job. No one will hire them. And so they are not going to lay on the ground and die. They're going to take what they need or want because that's what living things do. They, they survive. We are living things. And to be able to use the plants, as I've done for 39 years, to say, Anthony, you can weed that mess out. You could just as we are weeding this garden, you could weed out whatever it was that sent you down this path. But it's going to take work. And it's going to take you every day doing it. To know that weed seeds can remain in the ground for years until the conditions so they get the water, the light, the air that they need, and then, oops, they grow. It's the same with us. And to be able to say that and get away with it, because it's so cornball, is a wonderful thing. But again, using plants as an instruction, using the natural world to point out that there is hope within that grass that's growing. Look at the grass that's growing in the cracks. How does that happen? That same life force is within in us. 
and to be able, again, to point that out to young people and not so young people has been a real, I would say blessing, but that's, it is a blessing. It's a wonderful tool to be able to have in my little toolkit. Um, and, and when I worked in the jail every day, it was very difficult to go into a place filled with people that look like my family, filled with people who look like my children, and to know that they would be, spend their life coming back and forth and back and forth and had no life and basically were written off and we're paying for it while we do that. It was a very difficult, very difficult thing for me as a mother and now as a grandmother. But people ask me, well, how is it that you're able to continue? Because it is hard, it is difficult. Just last week I read in the paper about a kid that was with us in 2015, no, actually 2013, shot dead in the street, which isn't new. I mean, unfortunately, that happens a lot. But I remember this particular kid. I remember him being scared. I remember the other boys trying to beat him up and saying, you better leave, tell me telling him, you better leave that little boy alone. Um, I, but I also remember him saying, you know, I don't want to have to leave your program because and can't we just stay all day and can we, like, no, you have to go home. I have to, I have to go home. Um, and to read about him, again, it's like that is unnecessary because, again, we can do better, I think. But I, I believe that we have the answer to stopping crime. I believe that we have the answer to getting people fed. And I think that they go together. And it's not, and unfortunately what I learned in the jail, I learned that jails, yes, should have gardening programs, should have ways of inspiring and uplifting people. But the garden should be therapeutic. The garden should be a place where someone who's broken and hurt can heal and feel safe and be encouraged to start that growth. Start that reheal. Start that rebirth. Because the reality is you don't learn how to work by volunteering. You don't learn how to work when you're a prisoner because you're not getting paid. What is needed are wages. What is needed is a way for us to put people to work, help them do what, what we have done, all of us in this room are here because there was an adult in our life that said, you can do it, go. You can will help. And if they didn't say that, they said you can do it or you will do it. But they said something. Too many of our young adults have no one talking to them except maybe their phones or YouTube or whatever. And yeah, I, I guess there's a lot of stuff on there they can learn. But what they need to learn is from us as people. What they need to learn is that there are young men and young women who can go and who are going forward. And if they can go, so can they. When, when we're working, I always say to them, they say, oh, it's so hard, it's so hard. I'm like, I'm 100, I can do it. <laughs> and if I can do it, you can do it. And I, I've had them question whether or not I'm really 100. <laughs> and, then, and then say, oh, we thought you were about 80. It's like, oh, thanks. <laughs> thanks. Thanks a lot. But then, they, but then they'll say, oh, but you're so surprised. It's like, oh, great. And it's funny because I, I was telling the group earlier that many of the prisoners I remember really had no understanding of women, the men, the, men, the, men, the male prisoners, and thought all these crazy things. And it's like, no wonder you guys get in so much trouble, I thought. Um, but I, I really feel like, for me, they learned something different about women. Um, and I think it was a good lesson. And I think the young people are learning from each other and learning from the officers, learning from the, the other staff, the museum sends folks to take them on tours. This uh, company that has sailboats takes them sailing. They take them horseback riding, bike riding. Uh, our 
community college next door has workshops and stuff for them. For, for most of them, it's the first time that they've ever been on a college campus. It's, they're, they're, and not only that, it's the first, they're the first person in their family that's ever been on a college campus. And it's like we wonder what's go why is stuff going so badly? And I think what we've forgotten is the simple stuff of us being able to teach each other, being able to uplift each other, and being genuine in it. I'm not suggesting that everyone become a gardener or that everyone go and work in a jail or work with a difficult population. But I know that whatever we're doing, if we could share it with particularly young people, it would be an amazing help for them. But I also want to say that this program has been very important to me because what I have tried to give in this 39 years is what I have had. And that is a family that stands behind me, stands with me, a mother, a father, a stepmother, sisters and brothers that have had lives that were not easy, but went on and did what they could do. But also, I've lost two sisters to diabetes. I have 10 brothers and sisters that from my mother and father and four others from my stepmother and father. Out of all of them, three of us don't have diabetes. And so um, my sister who, who would come with us and work with us, she was a home economics teacher. And she, she taught, the, she would teach the people at Hetch Hetchy how to make a bed, how to, how, to, how to fold a towel, how to, you know, basic things. Um, she died of uh, pancreatic cancer. And I promised her, I said, you know, you can go if you want, but believe me, it's going to make me push vegetables that much more. It's going to make me fight to make sure that we can grow vegetables for that many more people. It's going to make me not give up. And so for the people that say to me, well, when are you going to retire? Guess what? I'm not going to retire. I'm going to keep doing this until it's done. Thank you. I'm going to keep doing it until it's done. I'm going to keep asking for help. I'm going to keep saying that we can do this. And when I read that, that uh, Johns Hopkins mission is to do big things. I know I've done big things. But I also know that in order to keep doing big things, I need people who are willing to say, yeah, this is a good thing and it works. And we've got the fancy whatever to show that. I promised the folks when I said that I wasn't going to be at work this week, that I would tell you all what it means for them to be able to go back and look, for Anthony to go back and look and see the trees that he planted that are now 20, 30 feet tall all over the city. To see the kids again who know the families and the people that are eating because of their work and to see them graduate from high school and go on to college and to know that they did that by working in our little dinky garden is an amazing thing. It's a wonderful thing. And I know that we've done good. And as I say to the kids, it's good, better, best. Never let it rest. Until the good is better and the better is best as my uh, English teacher told me once. I, I want, would like for uh, Alicia, uh, there's a, a video, another one that I wanted to show you. Um, and I am supposed to ask you to look at our website and tweet or whatever it is, and all that stuff you like and don't like or whoever. This one. Um, so if you would do that, that would be good.
Yes. So this is our summer program, and that was my brother Jonathan, and and So I just want to end by saying this is part of our growing program, beginning with the little ones. Those little ones um, come every summer. Um, we, this year we're going to have them. We're going to have the 11-year-olds, 11, 12-year-olds 11, for the month of June working with us. They don't get paid. 
um, but they are going to stay with us for the day, which should be very exciting. Um, but as you can see, these are children. And as you can see, these are children who are engaged with what they're doing. And I know that I had to work with children to remind me that change is possible and hope is here. And so thank you. Well, in the, the Sheriff's Department did a recidivism study, mm -hmm. and 75 percent of the ex-offenders did not return at the same rate. It is. And it is, as I said, I mean, most of, the, of, of our first group, the ones that are still alive, went on to, went to, unfortunately, people say, well, did they become gardeners? I'm not teaching gardening. I'm teaching work how to work and how important it is. And gardening is how we do it. I know, I certainly know of. Um, but I was curious about the, I'd be interested in the, to hear you talk about that ethic, that the values that drive, and you did that some in your really nice storytelling, thank you. Um, but I feel like, at least in the, in, the, in the food justice programs I've worked with, had the pleasure to collaborate with, I feel like outcome, you can have the same program technically, but the values. Well, it's, I, I guess, again, uh, I believe that it is very important. I know you're in a cage. It would be helpful to have something to inspire you to, to be able to withstand that cage. And so I would like to, to see if people are going to be in jails and prisons that we try to not, to not to forget that if you kick that dog, it's going to bite somebody. And unfortunately, prisons and jails, that's what happens. You're being constantly barraged, and there's, it's horrible, generally. Um, and people get out, and what I remember is sitting, is thinking, gee, these people are very angry and very hopeless with nothing to lose, and they are sitting on the bus with my little girl. Gee, doesn't it make sense for me to make sure that that's not the case with them? I have a vested interest. And I think we all have a vested interest and making sure that people are treated in a way that reflects our values. Um, and when we don't, to, to accept the consequences of that and to understand the consequences of that. But I, I think that it, it, it probably is, I don't think that it's a good idea when a lot of the urban sort of agriculture things center around, okay, we're going to make all this money. Sorry, that's not going to happen. You could sell as many baby carrots as you want, as I said to the group before. <laughs> but understand that organic farmers and commercial farmers have to keep their, their costs down. And they do that by not being able or not willing to pay those higher wages. But also, as a country, we need to say, hey, gee, people that labor are just as good as people who have PhDs or whatever. And we don't, and that's a mistake. And Wendell Berry, of course, has said that. Many people have said that. Um, but I think that the values that we aren't talking about is a conversation that we are really missing because it is something that we could talk about and help people to understand that it is a bigger issue of, of just, let's say, just crime. But they're not, again, just doing whatever because of whatever. There are reasons, and yes, there are people who just do stuff. But for the most part, it is based on what hasn't happened. 
with and for them, I think. We grew 100 tons of vegetables. You're asking me if we gave it to the prisoners? No, we didn't. We didn't because, oops, number one, uh, the seniors that are standing in that line for six and seven hours, they can't buy that $4 bunch of beets. Um, and unfortunately, the prisoners, many of them won't eat the beets anyway. But more importantly, I think that it's, it's critical that the giving be done. That's a good question. <laughs> and, and, and the answer is, I worked my behind off, literally. I mean, I, I was a size 16. I'm a size 6 Dale. So I did work my behind off. Um, <laughs> and, um, but, but also, during the course of all this, being able to connect with people, being able to, to share what we're doing, encourage people to, to replicate it if that's parts of it that fit, um, and, but also meeting other people that were interested in what we were doing and, and wanting to, to help us, support us, um, help kept us. As I said, the fact that my family has also worked our butts off too has helped. Um, but I think mostly it's because I am determined to do it. Um, well, and I and we struggle still. I mean, yes. and we struggle still. And and as you know, I mean, the root of this is horticulture therapy. And and while I didn't want, I'm not a horticulture therapist. I'm not trained to be a horticulture therapist. So people say, oh, you're doing horticulture. Well, I'm not doing horticulture. No, I'm just teaching people how to work, and we're gardeners. But on the other hand, horticulture therapy was the basis of of healing, therapeutic healing in this country, long ago. And and. Uh, you know, I would like to see young adults that are struggling to have access to farms and places where they can work and, and, and connect. Because what I see is, not, and again, not just the poor black and brown ones, the white ones and the Middle Eastern, all of them seem disconnected from themselves, from their families, from what's going on. And they do seem lost. And, and mm, for me, when we prepare their breakfast and lunch and make sure they have berries and fruit and, we're, and I'm talking to them every day about where we're going and how we're going to go and we're a team and we eat and all that stuff, they sit there and they, they listen to me and, 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 when I, and again, when I say we're going to do this, we're moving that tree, we're doing this, we're doing that, they're doing it. And I, I think that in other countries, they engage young people to do the work and teach them how to do the work. I would like to see us have a core of young people, just as we go to college, have them have the opportunity to learn how to work outdoors, have them have the opportunity to work 
doing some of the re restoration work that needs to be done in our outdoors, in our native areas, in our wild areas, and have young people start their careers in that way. I think that that's what's needed now in, you know, in my cornball kind of way. That's what I think. I think it is happening. So do I. One, one last question? Yeah, this question is for everybody in the room with us together here today. I am um, a new master gardener, but that has nothing to do with anything. My reason for becoming a master gardener is just so people recognize my intent and my desire to work with women coming home from prison who originally, before the lobbying went on, they could not get food stamps for two years if they had a felony conviction. So my passion, along with the group that I'm with, I'll do justice, was well, let's teach them how to grow. And because I was already a, grow, a growing school and just giving away in my community, nobody knew who I was, nobody knew where the moms were coming from. I was just doing it because it's what I was passionate about. Now that um, with um, the support of Parks and People, which is probably the pride deal for the years, um, we got a small, small grant. And the question for the people in the room is, I want to find out where these people are so that I can continue in a bigger way with this gardening therapy that I'm passionate about, that I, I'm the person who wants to do the work. But with the various transitional houses throughout the city having so much going on, I'm hoping that there are people in this room who know where these people are and can send them to me. So, I want to teach what I know. I want to help with the therapy. I'm passionate about it. The money will come, I know it will. Supporters will come, volunteers will come. But the grassroots, I'm on the, I want the people at the grassroots. I want the people who need the help. That's what I'm looking for. <laughs> yes, the organization is out for justice, but we started this little thing that I'm a coordinator of called Women's Reentry Initiative. So we're out for justice is the umbrella. And the Women's Reentry Initiative is just a gardening piece trying to help women come through, and, and their children, of course. If the women come, we can get the kids. Okay. So. That's true. All right. Okay. Thank you. And um, on that note, we. I'm sorry, we don't have any more time for any questions. However, we do have a reception in the colonnade. So hopefully you all are able to make some connections and network and we can continue to make change um, as Catherine has done within her community. Just a quick note, if you could please only use the door to your right to exit the auditorium. And if you could please uh, keep the food and beverages in the colonnade for the reception. Thank you all for coming.